Okay, so we will be talking about adrenal insufficiency today. Adrenal insufficiency, well, it's when your adrenals are really insufficient. And by that, I mean the hormones that it produces are not being made. Now, to think about adrenal insufficiency, we need to take a step back and really see what adrenals actually make and what the function of these hormones are. We know that the adrenal gland is very important. There are two adrenal glands, and they sit right on top of the superior surface of your kidney. They have an outer cortex as well as an inner medulla. Now, for this purpose, um, we are not going to be talking about the medulla because the main hormones that affect um, adrenal insufficiency are in your cortex. The main hormones are mineralocorticoids, which are aldosterone, as well as glucocorticoids, which is cortisol. Uh, something to remember, which may be tested on your board examination, is what part of the adrenal cortex is which hormone made. Well, you can always remember this by understanding GFR, glomerulosa fasciculata and reticularis going from exterior to interior. And you can remember a mnemonic, which is the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. So starting off from the top, glomerulosa layer, you're going to make aldosterone, which is the function is to keep salt in, right? Sodium, that's pretty salty. That's not too sweet. Going deeper, fasciculata, that's cortisol. We know that does sugar stuff like gluconeogenesis and all that. So that's sugar is pretty sweet. But what's sweeter than sugar is what's found in reticularis, which is DHEA, which is an androgen, and that's a sex hormone, which is, of course, sweeter than sugar. So what do these hormones actually do? Well, cortisol, we know, does a bunch of things in the body. It is a steroid. So you're going to be increasing your appetite, blood pressure. You can have insulin resistance. It's going to produce sugar through means, not through glycolysis, but through gluconeogenesis, breakdown of fats and proteins. And you also get decreased fibroblast activity. If you think back in Cushing's disease, why do they have abdominal striae? Well, because they don't have fibroblast activity and you get stretching of your skin, which causes that abdominal striae. And of course, decreased inflammation. Do you know why? Well, it's because cortisol, the steroid, actually goes into a transcription factor and decreases NFKB formation, which inhibits the formation of cytokines. And aldosterone, we know it acts on the renal tubules. Uh, it increases sodium and uh, makes potassium get excreted. And this eventually raises the blood pressure through water retention because you're retaining salt. So just to go over the mantra of this, the hypothalamus secretes corticosteroid releasing hormone, which acts on the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH, but then goes to the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol. And the cortisol, of course, has negative feedback at every step of the level. Aldosterone, however, is functioned by released by the RAS pathway. So just to go over it again. Your macula densa in your nephron senses low fluid or low salt, so it secretes renin. Renin in the bloodstream interacts with angiotensin released from the liver, which converts into angiotensin 1, which goes up to your lungs, where ACE rests, which converts it into angiotensin 2, which then goes to adrenal cortex and secretes aldosterone, which increases salt retention and water and decreases potassium. Now, before we move forward, I want to ask, well, this is how aldosterone increases blood pressure. How does cortisol increase blood pressure? I'll give you a few seconds to think. Well, cortisol actually has a unique way of increasing blood pressure. Firstly, the main way is through a permissive action. Permissive action means that it doesn't directly increase blood pressure, but it increases it in a different way. What corticosteroids do is that they increase alpha-1 receptors on uh, vascular smooth muscle. This allows increased sensitivity of norepinephrine to act on the alpha-1 receptors and cause vasoconstriction, increasing blood pressure. Another way is that if you have excess cortisol, it can actually act on the mineralocorticoid receptor for aldosterone and function as aldosterone with hypokalemia and hypertension as a result. Now, one of the board questions I got on my personal US Assembly Step 1 was that this guy was eating licorice, and what would be the effect? And the effect would be actually hypertension. And that's because licorice 
inhibits the pathway from cortisol to uh, cortisol. And this means that you're going to have more cortisol being shunted towards the mineral corticoid receptor and increasing the effects of it. So in terms of etiology, there's really three types, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The lesion depends on what type of problem you have. If your adrenals are messed up, you have primary. If your pituitary is messed up, you have secondary. And if your hypothalamus or you're taking exogenous steroids, then you have tertiary adrenal insufficiency. So let's go through these one by one because they're important and how you treat them is very different as well as diagnosis. So primary adrenal insufficiency. You're probably going to get the most questions on this because there are a lot of questions to ask. In acute primary adrenal insufficiency, it can be caused by massive hemorrhage, um, such as an aortic aneurysm, rupture, aortic dissection, which basically causes ischemia to your um, adrenals. Or you can have waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Does anybody know what this is caused by? Yes, it's caused by Neisseria meningitis. So that's another board question that they like to ask. Uh, now, if you have chronic disease, which is called Addison's disease, the guy who discovered this, it can have two etiologies. If you're in the Western world, it's more commonly autoimmune. If you're in the developing world, it's mostly TB. Now, one of the main things that distinguishes primary from secondary and tertiary is hyperpigmentation. Now, to think about why you get hyperpigmentation, you have to really think about what's going on. We know, if I go back here, in primary adrenal insufficiency, your adrenals are messed up. So you're not making cortisol, and ACTH is freaking out, your pituitary is freaking out and making a lot of ACTH to make sure your cortisol is being made, which is, of course, not going to be made because your adrenals are messed up. So you're going to be increasing ACTH, and you need to know where ACTH comes from. It comes from a precursor molecule called POM-C which to make ACTH, it needs to get cleaved into ACTH and this thing called MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which stimulates melanocytes to cause hyperpigmentation, which you can have, have hyperpigmentation of your gingiva as well as your skin. Now, because you have loss of your adrenal glands, you're going to have loss of aldosterone, resulting in hyperkalemia, and hyponatremia, and hypotension. And of course, you have loss of cortisol as well, and metabolic acidosis because you have hyperkalemia. Now, let's contrast this to secondary adrenal insufficiency. Secondary means your pituitary is gone. This can be caused by anything lesion over here, like pituitary adenoma, most likely a prolactinoma, or Sheehan syndrome. If you're giving birth, then you have ischemia of the pituitary. So, of course, this wouldn't have hyperpigmentation because you're not making ACTH, so you're not having POMC cleave to make melanocyte stimulating hormone. And, of course, you're not having any hyperkalemia because the adrenals are fine. Only cortisol is messed up, so aldosterone is still working. So that's going to control this. Tertiary adrenal insufficiency can be caused by brain tumors, but... Mostly, it's caused by sudden withdrawal exhaustion stories. And a question that usually asks this is that they usually have some sort of inflammatory disease, organ transplant, or asthma, any reason why they would be wanting to use steroids. And you suddenly take it away. And if you take it away, um, you're not getting any cortisol because this whole system is gone. You don't have CRH, ACTH, you don't have steroids, so um, you can cause hypotension and die. So what are the clinical manifestations? Well, the main feature is shock, as I said. It controls blood pressure, and if you don't have blood pressure control, you're going to be hypotensive, and you're not going to be perfusing your end organs, and you're going to cause shock. But really, you're going to present with nonspecific symptoms initially, if it's chronic at least. You're going to have nausea, vomiting, weight loss, fatigue, you're going to act very sickly. You might have this thing called acute abdomen. They don't really know what it's caused by, but you have abdominal pain this. Fevers, electrolyte imbalances, hyperpigmentation only if it's primary, and other autoimmune disorders because in the Western world, mainly this is an autoimmune problem. Now, in terms of diagnosis, there's two things you need to do. First of all, you need to prove that it is adrenal insufficiency. And second of all, you need to locate where this problem is. Well, to demonstrate adrenal insufficiency, you need to say that the adrenals are insufficient, and the way you do that is by proving that you have low cortisol. 
So you want to do early morning serum cortisol and should be less than a value of 3 because the normal is 10 to 20. You do early morning because as you wake up, you're at the, in the mornings, you have the highest cortisol levels. So if you have low cortisol levels when you should have the highest cortisol levels based on studies, then you know you are adrenally insufficient. You can also do morning salivary cortisol to prove this, but you cannot do afternoon serum cortisol because in the morning is when it's the highest and afternoon there's a lot of variability, so it really has no value in diagnosis. Now, once you've done that, you can find out serum ACTH levels because this will tell you if it's primary or secondary, as we've talked about. However, in an acute setting, you can't really establish the diagnosis based on this because cortisol comes back from the lab very quickly, but ACTH takes a while, and sometimes you can't wait that long. So you can do another thing. You can actually give ACTH as a stimulation test and then check the cortisol levels to see what's going on. So this is called the cosentropin stimulation test. You give a 250 milligram IV bolus ACTH uh, injection, and then after an hour, you see if it actually peaks to the highest range, 18 to 20. Of course, if it peaks, that means that ACTH can act on your adrenals and you don't have primary, but you have secondary insufficiency. And there's another thing called the metyrophone stimulation test. This is used if you have iffy cortisol ACTH levels initially. Um, it can help with the diagnosis. So what is metyrophone? It's a, it's a molecule that blocks 11-deoxycortisol conversion to actual cortisol happening in the adrenal glands. So if you think about it, if you give metyrophone to a normal person, you're going to be blocking this conversion. So of course, you're going to have low cortisol. You're going to have high 11-deoxycortisol. And because you have low cortisol, your pituitary is going to be going crazy and trying to make a lot of ACTH to stimulate it, and this is the normal response you get. But in primary adrenal insufficiency, where the adrenal glands are gone, and this happens in the adrenal gland, you're not going to be making cortisol. You're not going to be making 11-deoxycortisol. So metyrophone is not going to do anything. And you're going to have high ACTH because the pituitary is, again, freaking out to make more cortisol. In secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency, well, you don't have ACTH. So you're not going to even get to the stage. You're going to have low everything. So this is a quick uh, algorithm that you can use. Get ACTH, cortisol levels, everything's normal, no adrenal insufficiency. If you have low cortisol, low ACTH, you know, low ACTH. So it must be something wrong in your pituitary. So you want to go one step further to see if it's secondary or tertiary. Get a CRA stimulation test to see if the hypothalamus is working. And if it is not, if it does work, that means that hypothalamus is not working and it's tertiary. But if it doesn't respond, that means your pituitary is not responding to the CRH. And so it's secondary. And of course, low cortisol, high ACTH, primary adrenal insufficiency. So after you've established what is happening, you can do some tests to further see what's going on. So if you're thinking primary, you want to get an abdominal CT of the adrenals to see what's going on. They can be enlarged if it's inflamed, calcified. If there's any tumors over there, you can check for that or any hemorrhage. Here you can see it's quite enlarged and calcified. Of course, since in the developing world, it's due to TB, you want to do a TB test. And because it's autoimmune, you want to get some antibodies against 21 hydroxylase, but uh, there's, a, there's not a very distinct antibody that you can test for. Now, of course, if it's secondary, you're suspecting you want to get a brain MRI for potentially a prolactinoma. melanoma. So what do you do if a person presents to you in adrenal insufficiency? Well, the main problem is shock. So you're not going to be spending a lot of time to get these labs to come back. You want to treat them acutely, especially if they're acutely hypotensive and going into shock. You do but every, every, anything you do in hemorrhagic shock, right? You give two large bore IVs. You stick them in two because if one fails, you want to have the other one to fluid resuscitate. You want to draw blood to get cortisol, ACTH, glucose, electrolyte levels for later understanding and diagnosis. Infuse them with two to three liters of normal saline and give them four milligrams of dexamethasone uh, glucocorticoid, IV bolus over one to five minutes initially, and then afterwards every 12 hours. Now, why do we use dexamethasone? 
why not something like flutocortisone or um, hydrocortisone? Well, we use it because dexamethasone is preferred because it's not actually measured in the serum cortisol assays. And this is important because if you give dexamethasone and it's not measured in the cortisol assays, then later on when you actually do test for cortisol serum levels in ACTH, then this won't affect your actual diagnosis. Whereas if you give something like hydrocortisone, which is a straight up cortisol, that's going to increase your cortisol levels and may mask adrenal insufficiency. But if you already know this person has a history of adrenal insufficiency, you can give whatever. It doesn't really matter. You have a diagnosis already. Anything is fine. And if the mineralocorticoid uh, is not, of course, if the aldosterone is low because of adrenal insufficiency, you can give food or cortisone, which is an aldosterone analog at 0.1 milligrams once per day. But initially, it's not needed because giving aldosterone, it takes a while for the sodium channels to actually kick in. So acutely, it's not really needed. And of course, because you are giving a glucocorticoid, corticoid, you want to taper it off one to three days IV and then switch to oral so you don't have a rebound effect. So hydrocortisone is the main thing for chronic therapy. You want to give it at a dose of 10 milligrams per day, and you want to divide this into two or three doses. The reason why you divide it into two or three doses is because hydrocortisone cortisol is a short-acting uh, glucocorticoid. So you want to give it mostly in the AM when you want to, when you have a natural circadian rhythm of high glucose peaking in the AM and low glucose in the afternoon when you're winding down to sleep around 10 PM. So one third in the afternoon, two thirds in the AM. And this mimics the normal cortisol levels in your system per day. Now, it's shown that because your adrenals are messed up, you're not making cortisol, you're not making, um, uh, you're not making cortisol, you're not making aldosterone, and of course, the fasciculata layer makes androgens, so you're not making androgens as well. And it's shown that DHEA can actually improve the mood and um, well-being in women, but it's not really shown too much effect in men. Now, there's a neat thing that may come up on your board exams. If a person gets any sort of illness, like an upper respiratory infection, a UTI, anything that causes them, causes their body a lot of stress, they should increase their dose for glucocorticoids by the 3 by 3 rule. Basically, increasing whatever regimen of glucocorticoids they're on threefold for three days. And the logic behind this is, that you're going to prevent any adrenal insufficiency for happening and the glucocorticoids should not compromise the immune system, even though they are um, anti-inflammatory and decrease the immune system. So in the end, what does a person with adrenal insufficiency do? Aside from being on glucocorticoid therapy, potentially mineralocorticoid and DHEA, they should be wearing medic alert bracelets because they can go into adrenal crisis at any point if they don't have their glucocorticoids or if they go into any upper respiratory infection. So they must be carrying glucocorticoid vials as well as normal saline vials. Glucocorticoid vials to make sure that they can vasoconstrict themselves and normal saline to make sure that they can give some fluids when they actually need it if they become hypotensive. Carry syringes to make sure that someone can actually administer this and stuff in the vials and of course education to say that hey it's okay to do to inject yourself with glucocorticoids at a small margin to make sure that the threshold for injecting this as well as normal saline is small and that you do it very liberally because the effects of adrenal insufficiency are life-threatening. So that concludes this presentation and these are the references if need be.